This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. Another episode of Part of Darkness, the podcast about the dark side of creativity. And I am Kevin Couchman, joined by my partner in crime, uh, the master of ceremonies, the master of shenanigans, weekend shenanigans, <laughs> Brad Kelly. Brad, how are you? I'm doing great, Kevin. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing really well. I feel like we're on a roll with the yeah. show. Yeah. yeah, we're doing. Yeah, we are. And we're doing, mm. actually, interestingly enough, two weekends ago, we did core episodes back to back. Um, unprecedented in the podcast industry, I think, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> of PKD, the great Philip K. Dick, and Arto. Uh, I guess actually Arto and PKD. And then this week we're doing a sort of a podcast and it's double sort of thing mm-hmm. with back to back darkroom episodes on these two same two figures. So I think that's pretty cool. Yes, and you can already hear we have a couple of guests. We have Maddie and Josh mm-hmm. from the Evil thespian podcast and they are here for a dark room episode to talk about Anthony Narto mm-hmm. and they have a podcast which you should go check out uh, called called evil thespian and they also have a very special interest in French theater so they are uniquely poised to come and kind of give us a like a like a talk back or like a mm-hmm. I don't even know whatever we're just gonna we're just gonna hang around and talk about our toe for for an hour and then we will also do a Patreon episode. We are starting to get some traction there. We're starting to see people come through every day. Love it. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, doesn't that feel good? You're going, okay, well, yeah. somebody's, somebody's out there. Is there anybody yes. out there? Uh, <laughs> I heard Roger Waters last night. I had no idea he was so political. I went to see his show. Totally mm-hmm. insane. At one point, I just closed my eyes and listened to the music because I'm like, I don't. The guy, wow. who wrote, the, the guy who wrote The Wall is political? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, <laughs> I just, you know, but very theatrical and he put on a great show and I, you know, hey, he wrote some hits. That, yeah, that's forget, what matters. Like, yeah. He dropped yeah. some bangers mm-hmm. in his day. And yeah. he played, he played the bangers. So, yeah. um, uh, Maddie, Josh, welcome to, yes. uh, to Art of Darkness. We're so glad to have you. you. And, um, yes, I also think thank you for having us. I get to come on your, uh, your show later this month and we're going to talk about Peter Brook. Who has a bit oh, of Oh hell yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. <laughs> yes. I'm very he, excited. He, he has a bit of an Arto connection mm-hmm. uh, through I think they were the first ones to kind of produce Spurt of Blood. It, it, is that I think that's right. They did it like in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, gonna be a good time. Yeah, cool. I'm I'm great. stoked. Yeah, it's funny that you say um, you know, we've had sort of a streak of like French theater and French. Um, themes in our pod. It's been so kind of just by coincidence based on random plays and movies that we've stumbled into and want to review. Um, it's just been sort of a coincidence that we've been, our all of our conversations have dovetailed into sort of the French sensibility when it comes to um, arts and aesthetics. So that's very interesting because, I mean, I, Josh, definitely, um, I definitely had to study a lot of Moliere in um, my academic, during my academic rearing. Um, but it's it's been nice to sort of revisit that a little bit um, and touch on these things that kind of have paved the way for, um, you know, a a different and a different kind of spectacle that um, in history that kind of like, it makes you think because there's a lot of parallels to today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about that and sort of how we arrive at Artaud because I'll, I'll confess that like the French theater is a bit of a a gray area for me, but Mm -hmm. I've had more exposure Mm -hmm. than, the average person, <laughs> mm-hmm. just given my my background uh, in, in and around the theater and all the rest. But um, I mean, if you had to boil it down for somebody who you know only has a glancing knowledge of mm-hmm. of theater, what is it? Is it principally that it's more physical 
more gestural? Like what is the, the key difference would you say between, I guess, Francophone theater and, mm-hmm. and then Anglo theater? Well, if we are, it depends on what time and what sort of class we're talking about. I Mm -hmm. know that definitely when it comes to um, when Moliere was alive, the physicality, the gestures, the way the performer held themselves was extremely important. The performance style was very foppish. You, you know, all the men wore heels. You had to sort of, you know, puff out your chest and your shoulders had to be very back. It was very flamboyant and colorful. And it was sort of like a sort of like a celebration. And like, it's a comedy most, most of the time. And, um, and I think the foppishness is sort of what we understand today is, uh, you know, satire and satirical. And this was just a certain way in this time and place that, uh, you know, French, French people enjoyed satire. Um, yeah, it's almost like when I think about it, I think about it as a drag show a little bit. <laughs> a lot of wigs, makeup. Some of, the, <laughs> some of the best theater I've seen is is drag, you know, Shakespeare yes. and drag. That exactly. stuff can be yeah. so great. Yeah. yeah, and definitely I think the the musicality, all of Moliere's, um, you know, plays, they they rhymed. It wasn't necessarily like in that iambic pentameter, like Elizabethan theater, but um, it had a music, it basically was a song. Um, it sounds like when you read Moliere, it sounds like a nursery rhyme. That's like the best way I can put it. <laughs> right. And then like, and then you get the Alexandrian, which is like the, the French version of the iambic pentameter. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very restrictive kind of writing style. Um, and I think like that was kind of like what French language was for like many centuries. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's kind of like what Artaud was trying to rebel against because it is so restrictive. Um, and, and and that's what people don't understand about French language versus like the English language is that the French language has like a bureaucracy behind it, whereas like the English language is coming up from like artists and the people. Um, like mm. English is a much more populist language than French mm-hmm. is. Um, and so like, that's why like you get like the post-structural writers like Foucault mm-hmm. um, yeah. trying to break f- from that, that mold mm-hmm. to f- find, you know, freedom. Um, and Artaud much was embodied that. You yeah. Know? Wanted to decentralize kind of this very restrictive way where there was a lot of rules in place um, because it was good to just have that routine, have that structure in place. Mm-hmm. So anybody could just like, you know, plug in their performers and actors. It's kind of just like a common knowledge and you have like this custom and decorum in the theater um, world at that time um, where, you know, it was very important to sit, sit people in different places based on their class and um yeah i think mm-hmm. that uh kind of rollout was um yeah the reaction to that uh, is probably uh, the impetus for a lot of Artaud's writing that's very interesting did the french have a similar stigma and i understand we're talking about mm-hmm. many centuries here we yeah. don't want to be too general but did <laughs> they have a, a similar stigma around actors where actors are just one degree removed from outright prostitutes or were they were they <laughs> more respected yeah i think they i mean i don't think they liked actors as much because i mean moliere when he died like he had to be buried at at midnight you know i don't think that there there was prestige um afforded to actors Hmm. yeah you kind of just like lowered i mean I, i do feel like all actors at, at some point. I feel like even still today, actors are just kind of like um, the <laughs> like dirt, you know? Like they're just the lowest rung on the uh, totem pole a little bit. Ops that eat, yeah. say the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if, but of, of course, course there is like true. Sarah Bernhard. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, and then there's Sarah Bernhardt, who's a very famous French actress, um, and she was adored all over the world, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it, I don't think it, it you know necessarily was the most prestigious um, mm-hmm. occupation for one to have. <laughs> did they? I guess in the in the history of their theater, and I, I this is interesting to me. Uh, did they have a, like a di- different relationship to women on the stage, or did that all sort of shift roughly at the same period between the French and the English? And if you don't know offhand, mm-hmm. I mean that's fine. I'm just I, that would be interesting to look up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you know? French stage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the My, subject mm-hmm. matter um, was very 
you know, kind of kinky and t- tongue in cheek and, uh, you know, romantic, but um, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure men and women were actors. Um, yeah. That would make sense. As far as I know. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I'm reading about, I, I just did a quick uh, Google search. Brad, this would be a great guest to get on. There's a woman named Virginia Scott, and she wrote Women on the Stage in Early Modern France. Mm. Yeah, focusing on actresses in France during the early modern period, she examines how the stereotype of the actress has been constructed. Fascinating. Ooh. My, my, wouldn't that, yeah, I bet she so, had a lot to say about that. Yeah, mm. you know, it's funny, like, I don't have a, I never really have a, I don't really have a preference between actor and actress, although I do think actress sounds a lot more glamorous. Um, <laughs> but if I ever was a director, I would demand that people call me a director. <laughs> I just think it sounds nice. <laughs> um, that's or, that's yeah. tremendous. I like or a, or a podcastress. <laughs> okay, I like yeah. that. <laughs> um, I love it. Do you, are you guys um a, just it's kind of related unrelated um during like the surrealist movements um there is a Beckett piece called Play um and it is all about like these three people stuck in purgatory. I think it's Beckett. Um, it's one of those uh, like surrealist thespians. Um, but essentially, it is this very esoteric, uh, you know, existential play about. It's a one-act play um, mm. written in the early 1960s, um, uh, and basically, this play is just uh, three people on a stage, and they're in kind of these either trash cans or plant pots and they're just narrating (laughs) they're narrating their whole life um when they were alive um and the sort of the idea is that they're in purgatory um but you should really look up there's a youtube video like video version of it and alan rickman uh, is in it um it's pretty creepy Mm. um but i always thought it was like really really sick because it does remind me of sort of that when a very and uh and um, pretty good yeah. one. Beckett, I, I'm looking it up now, and this uh, mm-hmm. somehow escaped me. Beckett is going to be an episode and a half oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. when we finally it's get around to doing fun. him. Um, yeah, I, I found it. It's, it's a one-act play written in so 62 good. and 63, first produced in German as Spiel, which just means play, mm-hmm. on the 14th of June, 63, and then it premiered at the Old Vic in London. It was not well received upon its British premiere. Oh, and yeah. I, 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 <laughs> which I just want to read the, the curtain rises on three identical gray funeral urns about three feet tall by preference arranged in a row facing the audience. They contain three stock characters. <laughs> in the middle urn is a man to his right is his wife or longtime partner. The third urn holds his mistress. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's really genius. It's so strange, but I think it sort of, uh, you know, goes into the Arto conversation about the mm-hmm. threshold of language, because what you see in uh, Beckett's play is just a bunch, like three people babbling and talking over each other, and you don't really uh, get an emotion, you don't really yield any sort of emotion about the, the language or about how fast they're talking or narrating uh, the spectacle and uh, the sound of them like talking over each other and the sight of them sort of suffering and you get this very eerie feeling that's not yielded from the language or the plot at all. It's sort of, it is sort of like performance arts um, mm. that yields an emotional reaction, not from the language or the story or the plot, but simply from like you know from the whole spectacle um and i think you know there's a lot of people talk a lot of you know a shit about well, western theater principles but i think what arto um really emphasized on is sort of the spectacle nature and the gesture nature and the diction that can come out of that like aristotle's um eight principles of theater are plot character thought diction music and spectacle and yeah, plot, character, thought, diction, music, spectacle, uh, six, six uh, principles of drama. And not all of those things uh, you can really yield with language itself. Um, and that's, I think, something that, I don't know, it, it, yeah, it's a very practical and um, it's a very practical uh, vocation theater is. 
um, you can't just like write it down. Like it's so scary. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that bring you outside your comfort zone because there's you have to have music, you have to have uh, composition, mm -hmm. things that don't you can't simply put into words. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And the, the language obsession in the theater is a real problem because it, it, is. it, it falls into mm -hmm. this whole obsession we have with sort of psychoanalytics or like psychology. Mm -hmm. What is this character thinking? Well, I don't, what is anybody thinking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's more, what mm -hmm. are they doing? What do they want? Uh, yes. And exactly. you don't need language to communicate that. Um, in theater and its double, something important that is touched on is about the composition nature of theater and staging people in certain ways that informs us about what the character wants. Like a painting, he talks a lot about how theater is so similar to painting. So, for example, if I were to stage, um, you know, two people, one person is sitting on the couch and the other person is standing up facing away from them, we already can yield some kind of story behind it. It's already like making an impression, like composition is so important in that sense. Um, and I know a lot of directors are like, you know, staging is whatever, you can do whatever you want. But I think those um, certain uh, principles and that, that sort of practice is important because um, you can really make a scene a lot more weighty and uh, emotionally heavy just by changing somebody's position or gesture. Yeah, or by staging them inside an urn. Exactly. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, like, okay, if I want my, it's like, based, if I'm a character, I want my husband to feel pity for me or feel bad for me. I'll like walk into the apartment, like fall on the floor and lay down on my stomach. You know, <laughs> like, um, there are like, those are very like simple things to think about where you don't, yeah, you don't have to think about what the character is thinking. You know exactly what the character wants by sort of looking at their position and their body and their body language. Um, I have a little something. I just opened yeah. up one of my copies of the theater and it's double, uh, to his, some of his writing on the Balinese theater. Yes. Why don't I read this? Because mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's relevant. Um, I'm going to chop it up just a little bit because boy, our toe could really write some paragraphs. There's oh yeah. The really two, can, yeah. <laughs> two page long paragraphs. Uh, the Balinese who have a vocabulary of gesture and mime for every circumstance of life reinstate the superior worth of theatrical conventions, demonstrate the forcefulness and greater emotional value of a certain number of perfectly learned and above all masterfully applied conventions. One of the reasons for our delight in this faultless performance uh, lies precisely in the use these actors make of an exact, exact quantity of specific gestures of well-tried mime at a given point, and above all in the prevailing spiritual tone, the deep and subtle study that has presided at the elaboration of these plays of expression, these powerful signs which give us the impression that their power has not weakened during thousands of years. These mechanically rolling eyes, pouting lips, and muscular spasms, all producing methodically calculated effects which forbid any recourse to spontaneous improvisation. Uh, and then he goes on and he talks about spectacle. I just think this is mm -hmm. relevant. This spectacle is more than we can assimilate, assailing us with a superabundance of impressions, each richer than the next, but in a language to which it seems we no longer have the key. And this kind of irritation created by the impossibility of finding the thread and tracking the beast down, the impossibility of putting one's ear closer to the instrument in order to hear better, is one charm the more to the credit of this spectacle. You, you can't make sense mm -hmm. of it. And by language, I do, do not mean an idiom indecipherable at first hearing, but precisely that sort of theatrical language foreign to every spoken tongue, a language in which, which mm. an overwhelming stage experience seems to be communicated in comparison with which our productions, depending exclusively upon dialogue, seem like so much stuttering. That's the heart of it, I think. Yeah, yes. definitely, definitely because, a lot like, of stammering <laughs> in the theater. Yeah, because... Because like theater is about the senses and the body and, uh, you know, language is uh, a construction, you know, it's an mm -hmm. Apollonian construction and theater is Dionysian. And so, um, you know, language would automatically kind of cut us off from that, those abilities. Yeah. And I think I'm really interested in uh, the influence of sort of these oriental uh, th theater traditions and principles that Artaud was so moved by. I think, you know, first of all, 
he was really infatuated by the practice and the vocation of it because he knew that the Balinese theater at its heart is about life and reality. It's not necessarily about just a fun pastime and just producing entertainment. There's like very intricately detailed gesticulations. I feel like he either maybe knew peripherally or he would have been really inspired by um, no theater, um, which is an ancient uh, Japanese uh, theater, um, a form of theater. Um, and the word no comes from an ancient Japanese word, uh, no, which means skill or talent so mm -hmm. and their their um sort of impression and de definition of what an actor is back then is not so not so representational it, even now like there this no theater um tradition is still preserved but you have to uh train for years and years to make sure your gestures are completely perfect and extremely intricate and detail oriented and there are certain compositions and positions that every you know stock character has to be in and there are ways that you need to train your voice to make certain sounds and um yeah i do recommend anybody to um, look into no theater n-o-h um because it's there i mean it's it's not it's not just about language it's about you know these performers that train for years to learn uh, learn how to perform these stock characters perfectly um and i think that also you know goes i mean this is you know the true amongst all uh like asian theater traditions um sanskrit drama is the same way that's where the mm -hmm. um what's it called the <laughs> Oh, it's okay. it's like the hand, the hand positions. What are they called? Uh, are they called the mudras? The is mudras, yeah, um, I th yeah, the mudras. I believe so. Um, yeah, though this like very intricate details of the hand positions communicate a certain stock character or a certain story. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, no theater. Also, the the costume is so specific, and the the masks. I think also yeah, that's what that's why mask is like such an important the theatrical tradition because it's part of sort of the artistry and the craftsmanship of theater. Um, yeah, ever since ancient times, like it's, it was always important to have very, you know, delicate and intricately made masks. And I guess, yeah, the part, the vocation and the craftsmanship, I always feel like art is, or excuse me, acting is less of a art, more of a craft, you know? Hmm. But yeah, I think that's our, like what Arto really appreciated about the Balinese th like theater tradition is because it's so interest intricate and so much of it transcends language. Like you you yield so much not just from the language, from the whole spectacle. I'm sure that Bowie was uh, drew a lot that's, from No uh, yeah. very early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very oh, yeah. Like, also very influenced by Kabuki theater and uh, yeah. He was, he was a great sense. theater artist. He's going to be a fun one to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah mm. And you think about what these rock and roll shows look like now or what, what different shows it, it, it it's all theater. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're, even oh, if you're, yes. Yeah. yeah so mm, um, fun. Yeah. I, I do think that there needs to be sort of a renaissance of Artaud's <laughs> uh, values and principles yeah. when it comes to theater, because I think and this is something that really fucks me up. Like, um, you know, the, the arts, and the arts, art institutions are so decentralized, like we know this, um, but when it comes to like all of these subcultures and multiverses in every single uh, area of art, and like think about how many music, um, like small magazines, indie music magazines and blogs, there are so many. Think of how many film bros and all their little blogs and all the film magazines, like that's so much fashion magazines, indie blogs, tiny like places and these, um, you know, pathways and art that you can kind of like feel cool and discursive. And there's just nothing for theater artists in that sense. And I think there are many reasons for this, but um, Josh and I were in New York and we, we went into a magazine store and we're like, wow, look at all of these art magazines. And there's like the one little tiny backstage magazine that's like, has a little <laughs> poem on it and it's like so lame um but yeah it's very interesting i i think there are many reasons for this but yeah like mm. i think that's why theater gets a bad rap because it is so uncool and like <laughs> it was seen as something that's so gay yeah um, how did how did that ha how did that happen how did it become like 
I don't expect everybody you yeah. guys to give me a, a, a solid monolithic answer, but that's curious to me. Yeah, it like, is curious to me too. Yeah. I I don't know. I think my view on it is that we have a very narrow um, and pessimistic view of what a theater practitioner can be. Like Arto mm-hmm. was his own theater. He was a theater practitioner in his own way. And I think theater artists just have this very narrow goal of being something that you're told to be like you have to be an actor you have to do a play in this way in this form but you can just do a chamber theater in your backyard or your (laughs) apartment it's so fucking easy um and then like yeah i think also yeah there's just it's such a narrow um Um, we're just taught like such a narrow there's not a model like there's just a narrow model of what a theater practice it it just seems like scarcity mentality and it also has i'm sorry to talk over you there brad but it's a scarcity mentality and it's also um uh it really has a lot to do with American America's sort of puritanical streak. Yeah. It goes way, way back. Mm. So we have this really uneasy, awkward relationship with it. Yeah. I also think Disney is to blame in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and the, it, the yeah. Academy. Oh, I, I yeah. blame a lot of the Academy. Yeah. Okay. Like they're not, they're not uh, like creating artists like with backbone, with grit, you mm-hmm. know? And I think like that is a problem no too. Yeah, well, exactly. that's, that's, that's the thing is it's like we worship film and television practically. And so it seems like, it seems like theater could, be, in, a, in an alternative universe, theater would actually benefit from that somehow. But it seems like it, it has obliviated theater for, yeah. in the minds of most people. Right? Yes. And I think it's <laughs> probably the oldest form of mm-hmm. entertainment mm-hmm. in the history of a humanity. So every once in a while, there needs to be a sort of, uh, you know, crumbling down of everything. And yeah, I think there, there just hasn't been like a huge movement to reawaken that the theatrical tradition. Um, and yeah, I think that, yeah, we're people, it's a scarcity mentality. And also, I mean, to a lot of people's point, like it does, it does take a lot of um, expertise in different areas. Like, to make a yes. play, you have to like build, mm-hmm. you have to like build things, you have to like source materials. Um, I mean, it is easy, but um, it's, you know, it takes a team, definitely. <laughs> well, that was my biggest like thing with like COVID that I hoped would happen was that like a lot of these theater companies would like crash really basically. And then like we would have to like creatively get together and like rejuvenate the the form. But um they they're still here <laughs> they're still they're still uh um, doing their that's thing that's because it's, it's so um, much institutional money so they don't even really need yeah. audiences it's exactly. <laughs> weird bizarre you know uh here's here's uh, uh hamilton brought to you by Lockheed yeah. martin right you know yeah. it's just this strange and of course hamilton was a huge hit made a ton of money that's an outlier but there's just yeah. a lot of like dead regional theaters all around the country where oh, you man, there's the so is, there's so many of them too there's hundreds so and thousands i have so many i mean they they do well and they are they serve their communities um but they're all kind of the same everyone sort of does the same thing there's a i have friends who work in summer stock (gasps) and they love it and it's fun and um it it does serve the community but um there's just no it seems like there's no alternative sometime and sometimes no um which is like if people really want to be discursive they should just become theater practitioners because like everything else is so bloated Mm -hmm. like i'm not going to start another music (laughs) blog like but like think about the fine art like uh industry and like the fine art criticism blogs and stuff it's like everyone sort of says the same thing and um everyone like is so overeducated about all of those things but um people don't really care about theater in the same way and like we kind of just forgotten about it because it is so old (laughs) it's like such an old form um but the good i guess the good thing is um because it you can find good theater. You can find good indie theater. You just got to really, really look <laughs> for it yeah. um, right now. So, with, yeah. with the theater needs, like, but with, that has benefited cinema and, and fine arts, is it needs money laundering to get involved. Exactly. <laughs> you need to start a mafia. Yeah, so we need... Yes. The, the, the country was so much better when there was, like, the mafia running all the, the major Broadway. cities. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Nice. When Disney came in, and they're far worse. 
right? Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Because it's so it's so like they're just like they're just like a mass that you don't even really see. Like it's but yeah. it's so yeah. Oh, they're so they're more evil than the mob ever was. I uh, I would rather deal with Rocco from the docks who. <laughs> Who likes this actress in order to get my show on Broadway. At least yeah. it's more honest. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, this has me thinking about how I, I look for areas in life. And I guess you get this from being in theater and mm-hmm. from, you know, reading some theory and reading our tell, but I'm always looking for where life itself becomes theatrical, where, how to say, let me, let me repeat that um, or rephrase that. Uh, I'm looking for spaces where th- theatricality is operating, but nobody Mm -hmm. seems to realize that it's theater. Like a comic con is a theatrical event to my mind. Uh, A lot of crypto is theatrics inside Mm -hmm. very, very noisy chat rooms with very real stakes that people feel connected to. So I'm just, that's just something else that I'd volunteer. Um, Oh my God. I used to work in media and that shit is insane. So I used to work at a couple advertising agencies and it's the most theatrical. And I felt like I got so many amazing ideas for stories and plays that I would want to write, be meeting so many insane pathological people in media (laughs) it's amazing like these people sociopaths um and that's i mean our toe talks a lot about that like we have to sort of engage with our evil sensibilities it's so so important that every play is about people being on their worst behavior we always say like when you write a play it has you have to the character has to want to fight someone or fuck somebody like you're you, you either want to yes. kiss or kill somebody <laughs> and that you have to every scene has to have that dynamic and if you don't have that dynamic like you're going to lose people it's not suspenseful or exciting so um but yeah something that i've like noticed recently is that the problem like they show people on their worst behavior but instead like they will like the plays will show people on their worst behavior, but instead they'll like blame society for it. And as opposed to like why the play, like the people in the play doing it or blame other people for their problems. And I think like that is a, a the malaise of contemporary theater in my mm-hmm. opinion. That's might be reflective of society writ large a little bit. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting yeah. observation. Yeah. How everything, I mean, yeah. And how every like, academic institution is run and what the the playwrights coming out of them are like mm-hmm. can now a days it's just not yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it, it can be it can be a little predictable and tedious yes. yeah nobody nobody yeah. wants to attend church on a friday evening uh you know uh, theater theater church um we would call it a broccoli theater take your broccoli <laughs> yeah. NPR says this yeah. is a good theater to go and you're gonna go take your broccoli and everybody knows it and everybody is you know involved in it just kind of goes along with it but secretly and like behind the scenes everybody despises it (laughs) yeah i mean yeah there's like some broccoli theater like i do really like um but it just (laughs) it just sucks because like that's sort of all there is it's sort of a famine living in of um like live performance uh you know, events to attend to that are not concerts or, cause I think rap, like I love to go to rap concerts. I love to go to rock concerts. And like, I feel like those, I want my like plays I go to, to feel like a rap concert, you know? Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a hundred percent what I, how I feel. I, yeah. Even if it's, a, even if it's a reading, I don't yeah. want a 10 minute uh, speech from the artistic director begging for money. No. Right. They don't do no. that at rock and roll shows. <laughs> right. You get up, you introduce the show, you say what the theater company is, and then you introduce the play and you get, you get off. And then, yeah. do you know, like it, it, there's a quality of like, you know what we need to do? We need to unschool the theater. Yeah. American yes. theater has way t- too much school associated yeah. with it. Because to yeah. me, theater yes. is a sport. Like it's, yeah. there's a sportsmanship thing that goes into like how much like talent and skill and like physical uh, stamina you need to be like a no theater artist or, you know, somebody who has like more of a maybe Eastern, uh, you know, cultural rearing and tra- theatrical tradition because they see it as, um, yeah, almost like a, a sport, honestly. And it is mm-hmm. like very exhausting. There yeah. have been times where I've been in, I have a friend who actually works on television and he said something about like, you know, I, it's really hard work. Sometimes I'm on set for 16 hours a day, but the great thing about it is 
people who are there and working with me, they want to be there. Like they want to sit, like stand around for 16 hours a day. And it is really hard. Um, but yeah, I, I can really relate with that because like the times that like I've been in a show and I've I'm sitting around for like <laughs> 12 hours uh, and working for like 12 hours on my feet, like those are like the most rewarding times. Um, yeah. And, and then that's not even the performance itself. I know. <laughs> we, we did a, I was in a production of uh, Camus Caligula in Ooh. London in 2007. Mm. Yeah, wow. Camus is going to be a fun episode. Yeah. Um, and we would, we'd all be in a sweat by the end of that. Oh yeah. We, it was work. And yeah. Yeah. It should be like running a marathon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is like what kind of kills me about um, kind of artists who glamorize their own self mutilation and <laughs> glamorize uh, their drug use and suffering. Um, Cause if you're an actor, like you have to take, you're definitely not rewarded for like <laughs> being a crazed, like, uh, addicts and you know like if every good actor usually um you know has eats at least <laughs> i mean i'm i'm a huge i'm a very like i'm a huge drinker but i mean honestly like the best i've performed the best when i'm taking really good care of myself and yes. yeah it's yeah it's very it's it's very um you know tempting to like glamorize your own suffering but <laughs> better not <laughs> You know? I mean, I, I do think that theater needs to like return to its pagan ritual. Oh, absolutely. Roots, but not in like the pagan like uh, TikTok witch root, <laughs> like way. Like in a like yeah. uh, in a like this is like a serious thing. Like we're dealing with forces in the world that like can potentially like harm us, and like we need to like look at them and like reflect on them in a way. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just think that people are very like sentimental about it now, and um, don't take it very seriously, and which will inevitably bite us in the ass at some point i think i think it already is i think the yeah. breakdown yeah. <laughs> in american society i think it sounds corny but i mean i think if we just had vibrant community theaters and people actually getting together it would be it would look different the country would feel different but yeah. we just don't yeah like you don't you don't think of because think of like the ancient greeks where like theater used to be like so chatted out like it was mm -hmm. like a sport and like nowadays you don't really think of theater as being like oh it's so chatted like it is just like the most chat thing ever because i i have friends like we think like when i when i was going to school like that was just like the most chad thing to do is be into theater. <laughs> then when we really? all left, yeah. But then when we all left school, it's like, oh, I guess not. Like, guess I'm like weird, <laughs> like uncool. But um, yeah, I love like I have friends now where it's just like that's the energy and which is like fun and cool and aspirational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like too, lifting like, weights. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Arto, uh, actors must be athletes of the heart, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, God, yeah. Yes. Oh, I love that quote and. I mean, you know, and, and you think about, you, you, I, I, it took me a minute to realize you were saying chatted out. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was like, ah, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love when the, inter, the new internet yeah. uh, dialect bleeds into, I know. well, yeah. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, oh, y y don't, go, don't go to Toastmasters. How mm. lame is Toastmasters? Go mm. into the theater. Go down to your community mm. theater and take some acting yeah. classes. That has some soul anyway. I mean, whatever. If you get something out of Toastmasters or the Rotary Club, go and do that. But if you have any artistic streak in you, just go be an actor. Just go yeah. read some plays. You're, yeah. you know, it, I mean, I remember being a young person and, and being uh, more anxious than I am now, less secure and it being being afraid of going in public and afraid of, of talking in public. And just the practice of doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like a... I mean, we're talking, we're talking about like being a renaissance person, right? A mm -hmm. renaissance man, a renaissance woman, whatever it is. Um, a directress. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> this, is a part of, uh, this is a part of what it takes to be a leader, is to mm -hmm. be able to get up in front of people and talk in yeah. public. Uh, so I, I don't know. I think if you're a young person, yeah, go do your, your, uh, your karate, your judo, your jujitsu or whatever, but... You know, yeah. think and about I, the theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, even with like podcasting, it's still something that I'm working on. Sometimes I will like, listen back when I'm <laughs> editing. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I was not killing it here. Um, where's the facial, <laughs> what, what do we say? Uh, forward facial posture, um, you know, where, where's the diction? Um, mm. So it's just a really good practice. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. We've <laughs> yeah. released nothing but bangers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's this, <laughs> there's this thing called, uh, well, I don't know, Josh, 
Josh, because I I <laughs> like grew up. All right, Josh went to theater school, and I think I don't know, Josh. I don't want to speak for you, but I like went to study acting mostly. Um, but there's this thing called forward facial posture, and basic mostly for singers. But if you uh, like like poke out your lips and like make an O and allow the sound to come out of your voice, it sort of like maximizes the sound to let, let it like, you know, pass through you essentially just, huh. um, yeah. yeah, essentially just move your lips and don't like mumble. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> don't be a mumbler. Right. You know? mm-hmm. well, <laughs> and going off of that, when I, when I was in a collaboration class, the theme for it was a uh, Brecht and Arto one mm-hmm. semester of mm-hmm. sophomore year. And my uh, acting professor, Scott came into the class and he had one of my classmates get up and perform a monologue. And while he was doing it uh, was banging pots and pans and the person had to like keep saying the monologue over it. And later did I realize that that was like an Arto uh, theater of cruelty exercise. And it, cause it really like gets you to the primal need to like communicate, you know? And like, cause you're like just trying to like get over the the sound and like trying to like get the words out and everything. And um, I mean, it's just, it was fascinating. And uh, I remember he asked like what, what, our class thought of it and one of my classmates said like oh if i paid to see that in a theater like i'd be so i'd be so upset but like scott was like well you should stay curious about that because like the moment that you have expectations on the theater like it like kills theater in a way Mm -hmm. um and i and i've always taken that with me and there was another exercise that he did with his uh, voice students where they would like roll around and paint and like. Oh, I did some uh, rolling arounds. Another... Yeah. Well, and that that's a, did, that's yeah. a that's a that's a an Arto exercise yeah. as well. Theater of cruelty exercise. Like they would roll around and like yell, and he would bang pans as they were doing yeah. it, and yeah. Oh my God. Arto is really to... great for the is really great for the great for everyone. <laughs> yeah, those practical exercises are so helpful. I was in a voice and movement class where we had to memorize a Shakespeare monologue and then we had like two chairs that we had to like walk back and forth in between and we probably had to just um, recite our monologues over and over again with everybody else around, you know, reciting monologues over and over again. Um, yeah, it is almost very like, yeah, theater of cruelty and like surrealism, um, where it, it makes you stay like very focused almost. Um, yeah. It sounds like some like Navy SEALs training it, stuff. It is kind of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fewer fewer push-ups, but yeah, yeah, oh yeah, Um, (laughs) but yeah, we 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 did a lot of like the weird like esoteric stuff, but that that honestly it does help. It looks you look insane, but some of it honestly does help. It's all in service of something, yeah, bigger than yourself, you know. I I recall being on all fours and bleeding like a sheep with about twenty other people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Devin, we're talking about theater right now. Oh, yes. oh, oh. That was, that, that was the other meeting <laughs> with Rocco by the docks. <laughs> well, I want to hear a little bit about the, the background of your pod, and then we'll, yeah. we'll come back for, the, for our uh, beloved Patreon subscribers. I think on the, the dark room, I think I'm going to read a little more from uh, the theater uh, and its double uh, yeah. on the uh, the after dark yes, episode. Yeah. Yes, um, but t- tell us about evil evil thespian. What was the gen- oh. gen- uh, genesis of this? How did you two meet? Oh my uh, god! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was in the malaise of COVID, and I noticed that theater was going in a direction that I was very worried about, and it was getting very political. And I was like, we're losing this magical ritual aspect of it, very much like how our toe felt. Um, And so I started the podcast with my friend uh, in April of 2021. And and I realized that there was like nobody from our corner of Twitter that was like really like uh, taking a dissident perspective on theater. You know, everybody, there's always like that, you know, very uh, liberal way of talking about theater. Um, And so I kind of like wanted to interject my uh, perspective of nature back into the conversation about theater. Um, And so then I I started it in April 2021 and um, I was doing it with my friend and then he decided that he didn't want to do it any longer. And so then um, Maddie had written an essay about um, slave play, Jeremy Harris's slave play um for twink revolution and i read it and i i really liked it and i 
Um, and then, you know, we became internet friends. And when I was like looking for a new host, co-host, uh, I asked Maddie and she I was willing it. to yeah. jump in. Yeah. And we were both, history. yeah, we were both like kind of spazzing out and our like aggregate interests sort of linked us together. Um, and yeah, it was, I had nothing going on at all. So I think that's why I was just like going insane a little bit similarly mm. to Jeff. <laughs> so we just needed to, we just need to have a, an outlet for us to like kiki together and like read stuff and we've oh my god we've been reading so much like these this past year um i swear to god i i probably read like five like 10 plays within the last like couple months like Podcasting so many plays. is like going to grad school like it, it, <laughs> it really, really is. is we've just read so much but yeah I, I can't believe it like i feel like 10 times smarter than i did like before the podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we. I think Kevin and I could relate to that. We do oh my God. so much preparation for this show. We yes. come out of it, and it's like, man, yeah. It, it, I, when I was in school, I was oftentimes trying to get out of doing stuff. Exactly. You know? I was like, I, <laughs> I don't want to. I did. This. I did most of the work, but yeah. I would look for corners to cut, and I don't look for corners what? to cut doing yeah. the show. So yeah, that's good. Um, that's the, that's the thing. Is like I was assigned. Like I was like asked to read the theater in its double my sophomore year of college yeah. but i wanted to have fun instead right, and so right, I did right. actually yeah. read it until like summer of 2020, uh, 2019 when i was working on a production of phaedra and the the director was really um inspired by the theater in its double and so then i i read it and um i was where i found it very um inspiring and yeah the theater should attack you viscerally it shouldn't mm. feel like a plague yeah Indeed. Yes, it should. Have you two met IRL? <laughs> yes, yeah. we just okay. met. Okay. Yeah, we just met IRL recently oh, in cool. February. This past, or Wait, this when past was March. that? Oh, March. Yeah, it was, yeah. My, it was my spring break. Yeah. yeah. And then, so, yeah. And then we went to New York recently to go mm -hmm. see um, our friends play. Two of, two of our friends plays and then um and then maddie just got married <laughs> and then <laughs> so, yeah josh was there for that thank you all right um, well. yeah <laughs> and you turned 28 so you you I avoided know. the 27 club which you were talking oh about my gosh show. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm, I'm honestly so proud like i feel great and uh, it was weird because josh also met me in the weirdest time of my life i was just i had a whole bunch of people that like died in my family back oh, to back no. oh. and like i it was like our I've first yeah it, it was like our first episode we were about to record and i was like coming back from a funeral oh, and then yeah. i like had a bunch of health problems um but and i was like this guy probably thinks i'm insane um but no it's it's worked out great so phew yeah <laughs> yeah awesome. well you know i i like to say brad is my podcast husband uh, yes. we, yeah. we we yes. can totally relate you got to have these uh creative yeah. relationships <laughs> nothing nothing yes. weird about that brad no <laughs> not at all yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. Normal. but i i wonder how many shows uh began in the at the sort of height of the plague oh which, let a which thousand no podcasts longer... bloom covid yeah right yes seriously. Yeah, yeah 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 i feel like half the stuff i listen to at some point they say well covid was going on and so i thought yeah. that i yeah it's i mean yeah. it's great and, and it hey maybe good. that's the maybe that's the, the the silver lining to it all yeah. it's like we all got a maybe, minute maybe to this was figure a plot yes. by pfizer to saturate the podcast market they could be. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, that's actually not. You yeah. are getting your Pfizer check, right? Wow, Kevin? That's yeah. like getting, oh, wow. Yeah. Schizo posting on the no. pod. <laughs> no, this was a, this was a plan. Uh, yeah, it was a, it's a conspiracy from Zoom.com to make yeah, everybody yeah. pay the professional $20 a month. It's the right. Yeti, yes. the yeah. Yeti microphone company yeah. is conspired yes. with uh, the, yeah. Yeah, knows? Yamaha or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, just, we just did the PKD episode, so I'm still kind of in that, in that yeah. space. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, and for, for, for folks who uh, haven't heard your podcast before and want to, ch want to check it out, it's more than just you two chatting. You have guests on. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, how would you describe the show? It's different every time. We usually pick um, a subject matter or we usually either pick a, a piece of art, usually either a play or a movie that is tangentially related to a uh, play or some kind of theatrical, you know, a topic. Um, so we'll either do that or we'll have a guest on. Um, we love talking to actors and playwrights. That's mm -hmm. probably been, that's one like our favorite time that we get to have a guest on. So yeah. Cool. 
Awesome. Well, Yay. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to read Yay. and we're going to, we're going to come back. We're going to talk for another 20 or 30 minutes on the, uh, the after dark. I'm going to read one more bit from uh, the theater and it's double. And I think this is Sweet. again, relevant and uh, relates, I think uh, Josh to what you were saying about how you were feeling about the theater. Here's what he said. Uh, theater is no longer an art or it is a useless art. It conforms at every point to the Occidental idea of art. We are surfeited with in, uh, ineffectual decorative feelings and activities without aim, uniquely devoted to the pleasurable and the picturesque. We want a theater that functions actively, but on a level still to be defined. We need true action, but without practical co consequences. It is not on the social level that the action of theater unfolds, still less on the moral and psychological levels. Clearly, one more parry here, clearly the problem is not simple, but however chaotic, impenetrable, and forbidden our manifesto may be, at least it does not evade the real question, but on the contrary, attacks it head on, which no one in the theater has dared to do for a long time. Nobody up to now has tackled the very principle of the theater, which is metaphysical. And if there mm. are so few worthy plays, it is not for lack of talent or authors. Damn. Wow. Like so that. true. Spitting. Yes. <laughs> Absolute bars. Yep. bars. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, come back in in five minutes and do the after dark. Uh, if you're yeah. interested in in that and and if you want to hear Brad rap, that I, that, that you is, can subscribe to the Patreon uh, on another one. I'm not wait. rapping today. I don't. I'm I'm oh not. You know. I'm not up for it. Patreon.com/slash <laughs> Art of Dark Pod. Yeah. And I think and the, and the tiers start at like three bucks a month. And yeah, three bucks a month. You say, get the after darks. You get the quarterly uh, 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 post mortems. Post -mortems. Yes. Um, that that's pretty much it. But that's a lot of content, frankly. Yes, so. that's a lot. Really? Wow, good yeah. for you guys. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And well, and thank you both for coming on. I I I'm subscribed to your thank show. You I'm gonna us. I'm gonna go and give you give you all a five star. I gotta remember to do Yay, that. Thank uh, you. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and everybody spread the love. And, and yes. I'm, I'm serious. Everybody yeah. and everybody yeah. listening to this. If you yeah, whatever. If you can't scrounge up three bucks a month, j tell somebody about the show. Mention yeah, the show. Actually, you're out there. We're trying to grow. We're doing something real here and making these these um. Uh, these real connections through the through the inner tubes. Um, so, Josh, Maddie, uh, real pleasure, and I, and I get to come on your show. Thank uh, you. uh, late, uh, I think in August. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. we're cool. so excited yeah. to have you. Okay. Well, I'm going to close this down, and we'll come back in five minutes and do another half hour. All right. Sounds Perfect. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. A second.